Today we're going to start looking at um, a topic called Venn diagrams. Uh, you may have seen these before, you may have utilized them in this way before, or you may not have. Um, these are more commonly taught uh, in grade school these days. Uh, my daughter came home from second grade years ago, because she's a senior in high school now, years ago with a Venn diagram. Um, not with what we're doing with it, but she was utilizing it for another purpose. So if it looks familiar, it probably is. You just may be doing something new with it. Um, Venn diagrams start out by looking like a rectangle, okay? And the rectangle itself, this box, is the universal set U. So our box is the universal set U. Um, so U could be something that's infinite. Right, it could be like all the natural numbers. It could be that. Um, or it could be just a collection of things like you've seen um, so far where we've said U is the numbers from 1 to 10. Um, so it, it can be literally anything. It doesn't have to be numbers. Um, again, we've talked about sets in the last section. This U could be our class, right? So it's just all the people that are in our class that would be in this rectangle, um, you know, metaphorically speaking. And then we have um, circles inside. Sometimes there's multiple circles. I'm just going to put one for now. Um, but there are sets that are inside of the universal set. So the circles represent other sets inside the universal set. Um, so if this universal set were our classroom, maybe the circle represents all the girls, right? So it would be a collection of things that are somewhat smaller than the whole thing in general. Um, or maybe the circle represents freshmen. Okay, so it somehow is a smaller grouping within the grouping you have. If we were looking at the natural numbers, right? If this rectangle, the big rectangle is the natural numbers, maybe the circle inside is, um, you know, evens or something like that, right? So the next thing we're going to look at is what a complement is. So the complement of a set for any set A within the universal set U, the complement of A in your book uses the notation where it's got a prime. It kind of looks like an asterisk on the end, or not an asterisk, but like a, um, an accent mark on the end. A prime is all elements U that are not in A. And the set notation is below that. So this is A prime is X such that X is in U, X is not in A. We talked about that notation next time. I'm going to go back to my picture here in a second, but let me let you finish filling that in first. I'll flip back to the screen in a moment, so if you're not quite done writing, I promise we'll come back to it. This was our picture before. I want to add a couple details to our picture now that we have this idea of a complement. If this circle is set A, right, everything inside here is set A, then A complement is what's in the box on the outside of the circle. We'll shade it in a different color. Uh, I'll use yellow. So everything out here would be the complement. Does that make sense? Okay, it's the opposite description of whatever I described before. So it's the boys when I described the girls. It's the upper class and when I described the freshmen. It's the odds when I described the evens. It's the complement. So we're going to do an example where we have a universal set that's not quite as large as the ones I was describing. This universal set is simply the numbers from 1 to 10. Okay? 
So if you imagine the big rectangle box, you can draw it if it helps. This one doesn't necessarily need it. Um, but all the numbers one through 10 are floating inside that box somewhere, right? The numbers that are inside the circle are written here. One, two, three, four, seven, and 10. And the directions want us to find the complement. So the complement means all the numbers one through 10 that I didn't just highlight, right? Everything that got left out. So I don't include one, two, three, and four, but I would include five and six. Seven's already there, so eight and nine. And my math lab generally tells you to put things like in ascending order or something like that, you know, from smallest to largest, those kinds of things. If it doesn't, then it's built it in, then it doesn't care whether you put it in a specific order or not. Does that make sense? So if this set is what we would call A, then this set would be called A complement. Um, just for a reference point, if you were to see complements in other textbooks or if you were Googling something and you wanted to see complement, there's a couple other notations you might see that are equivalent. So a complement looks like that for us in this book. Um, another book I teach about, uh, teach from, puts a bar on the top of it like that. That's what they use for a complement. And there's another notation actually that uses a C up there, kind of in that exponent or that, um, you know, uh, that prime location instead. So these are all notations that are um, widely accepted for complements. All right, number two is very interesting because number two doesn't actually give you a list of numbers. It tells you you. So if I have the complement of the universal set you, that means I need everything in the universal set that is not in the universal set. And that sounds really funny. Any idea what the complement of the union of the universal set U might be? Negative right? Mm-hmm. But what would it be? Not negatives. They're not in the universal set, right? So it has to be items from oops, I need another color. Items from in here that are not the universal set, which is the numbers one through 10. Does it no, but you're getting close. It exists, and we talked about it last time, actually. Points. No? <laughs> That's it, good job. It is the null set. It's the set with nothing in it. So it exists, it's just highly uninteresting, right? It's the infants in my home. Right, that's what I use as an example. They don't exist. Okay. So the interesting thing about this is that if you would call this A and you would call this A complement, which would be a weird way to mark it or whatever, is that they always have this relationship. They're always complements of one another completely. So for example, if the problem instead of starting out as find, I'll use this sort of like to be what is the complement of the empty set? That would actually be the universal set too. So they go back and forth, okay? So it's kind of a tricky one, which is why I mentioned it actually. All right, a few other things. Um, so we created this circle that was inside of the rectangle. Um, it was a set inside of the rectangle, right? The universal set. And we could actually con create concentric circles, right? Circles inside of circles. Um, those are actually called subsets of a set. So a set A is a subset of B if every element of A is also an element of B. So I'll go back to my picture, just fill in the first one for now. I promise I'll come back to the second and the third descriptions. But what we're gonna draw is we're going to draw a circle inside of another circle. And I'm gonna draw it the way that this is worded, which is A is a subset of B. So now notice that notation, it's got that, it looks like a C now. Um, we had E's before, they were element of in our last lesson. This notation almost looks like a C with a line underneath it. One of the ways you can interpret that C that's sort of um, nice uh, grammatically or um, alliteration wise is contained in. Right? A is contained in B. Well, that makes sense, it's inside of it, right? The little bar underneath, that equals bar, means it could be equal to it. 
Okay, that's what that, that bar really means underneath. Just like when we have a, you know, a less than, whoops, like a less than or equal to symbol. It means it's less than or equal to, right? So that equals underneath means it really could be exactly the same as. So over here with my picture, it said set A was contained inside of set B. Let me erase my colors. <clears throat> so set A contained inside of set B would mean that I have a circle B that encompasses, that surrounds the circle A. Everything inside of A is inside of B. Well, yeah, because the whole circle A is inside of B, right? So this is the, the Venn diagram expression for this concept. Set equality, we talked about this last time. Uh, we said two sets are equal if they contain exactly the same elements. That's how we talked about them. Um, so an example I gave is that if Dr. Hans talks about her family um, and Pastor Jeff, that's my husband, talks about his family, and we're talking about our children, right, in terms of our, you know, like immediate family, we're talking about the same people. Um, and so those are equal sets. So this is an alternate definition of set equality. Um, if A and B are sets, that means A is equal to B. If A is contained inside of B and B is contained inside of A, right? A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. In other words, the only way this works, because of the containments, right, is if that equals on the bottom is actually what's going on. Every element of A has to be inside of B, and every element of B has to be inside of A. Um, this equals business is a little awkward. Um, and visually, it's really awkward, because this picture would be true whether or not there's anything in that sort of outer space, you know, this outer ring. Even if this outer ring were sort of, you know, vacant and it was just dead space with nothing in it, the picture would be accurate. But it's sort of weird, right? We kind of feel like there should be something in it, or what's the point in drawing it, don't you think? So we have one more description here, and it's called proper subset. So proper subset means that there is no ability for that equals to happen. So a set A is a proper subset of B. If A is a subset of B, obviously, right, that circle diagram picture works, but they're not exactly the same thing. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I have a brother-in-law who has uh, an older daughter. Um, she's married now, but an older daughter from his first marriage. And then he has three children with uh, his wife now. So if each of them were to describe their biological children, biological children, they would not be equal sets because my brother-in-law has four biological children and my sister-in-law, his wife, only has three. You guys know families like this. In fact, many of you might be from families like this. Everybody following so far, okay? These are not equal sets. So if my brother-in-law says my biological children and my sister-in-law says my biological children, they are actually not equal, okay? So what happens on this one is that there's something inside of this B, that would be my brother-in-law's um, family, you know, his biological children, um, namely Madison, my, my niece, who is not in A. She is not my sister-in-law Jody's daughter, biologically, okay? So they're not exactly the same. There's something in that dead outer space where I've put that yellow. That would be my, sister, my, daughter, my niece, Madison. So we're going to do some examples with this, but any questions so far? Okay. So we're going to decide in these examples whether we can put the proper subset, the general subset, or both. And I'll give you a hint right now, and I would encourage you to write it down. If you can put proper subset, you can automatically put subset. So what that means is there's really only two possible, oh, and there's neither, I'm sorry, there's one option there. So there's neither is an option, but this option right here automatically makes this true. It's guaranteed. It's part of the definition, right? Look at this over here. The only way I get to have the proper subset is if I already had a subset to begin with. So there's really only three things that I could be writing down, even though it looks like four. I could be either writing down both. I could be writing down subset, which really would mean they're only equal. 
That's what would mean this here, here. It would mean that these are equal things. Or I can be writing down neither. And we'll talk through them to make sure that that makes sense with actual concrete examples. Okay, so on number three, <clears throat> I need to know what the relationship is between the set BCD and the set BCDF. In other words, is every element here also over here? So first of all, is it true? Is B on the left side, on the right side as well? Yes. Is the C that's on the left side on the right side as well? Yes. And is the D that's on the left side on the right side as well? Yes. There's a subset here, so neither is not going to be the happening thing, all right? It really is a subset relationship. Is it a proper subset? Okay, so I'm getting lots of yeses and lots of noes, which means that I've not clearly defined what proper is, is what that means, because we're confused. Proper means that there's something in the one on the right that wasn't on the left. Is there? Yes, there is. F, right? I think it was that one, yeah. F. F is not in the other set, correct? And because that's true, it is a proper set. If I were to draw the Venn diagram picture of these, and I were to put these letters in, I've got B, C, and D here, and I have F out here. It is not dead space. And that's what it means to be a proper subset. There is something in that outer ring, okay? Another way to define it is that you can say that this set on the right-hand side over here is bigger. It has more stuff in it. It's got to have the right stuff first, which we already checked that. It has the right stuff. It has the BCD, right? It's got the right stuff, but it's also actually bigger. So what does it mean? Well, it means that I could put the proper subset notation, and that would be true. It is a proper subset. But I could also put just the subset notation. That's true, too. Because if it's a proper subset, by definition, it has to be a subset, right? It's like when you put um, adjectives on a lot of other things, right? So if you say um, that uh, I'm, um, a, if I'm, I'm a sister, right? That's, that's a phrase. Well, if you say I'm an older sister, it automatically means I'm a sister. Right? It doesn't negate the other one, right? It just further qualifies a descriptor. It's an adjective. The word proper is an adjective describing subset, but the fact that the subset's already there means that you've already got that curly one with the line underneath going on. I mean, you have to have that notation. So what goes inside this blank, since I have both of these options, is the word both. It can be the proper subset, or it could be the subset notation, because both are true. Let's take a look at number four. So again, you always want to establish whether everything on the left actually is on the right. So we're going to go piecewise. Is the nine in the right, on the right side? Yes. Is the one on the right side? Yes. Is the seven on the right side? Yes. Is the three on the right side? Yes. Is the five on the right side? Cool. So this means automatically, I know for sure in this blank, I'm going to put one of these. That's an option. The question is whether or not I can also put this. So this happens again if they're not equal. It is a subset. We agreed. Yes, everything on the left is on the right. Are these sets equal or are they not equal? They're equal. They got exactly the same stuff in them, right? Five items on the one on the left, five items on the one on the right. They're exactly the same. So while it's true that I could put equals here, that is not one of the multiple choice options, right? It's just not. I have four choices, and that's not one of them. So even though that's a true statement, that's not the one I'm allowed to put there. The only thing I can put there is the one that I've already written down, which is this subset notation. It's a subset. It's weird. It's weird to describe it that way, right? For me to say that my children are a subset of my husband's children is weird in our family because they're the same set of kids. But it wouldn't be weird in my brother and sister-in-law's family. Okay. How about the last one, number five? We'll just go down the list. Negative one. Fails right there, right? We don't have to go any further. That negative one that's in the left-hand subset or left-hand set is not over there on the right-hand side. So what's going to have to go in that blank? Neither. 
right? Our choices were up here. I didn't mark them very well. In reality, our choices are this, uh, sorry, this one, which we already used, the word both, which we already used, and the word neither. Those are our, really our three choices, although it looked like there were four. Okay, any questions on those? Okay, they're tricky the first time you work through them, but just keep going back to those definitions of what it means. All right. When you have a set, you can have lots of subsets, right? So when I talked about this class in particular um, being a set, I talked about the fact that we could have, right, the girls as a subset um, of the group. We could have boys as a subset of the group. We could have freshmen as a subset of the group. We could have under 20 as a subset of the group. We could have married as a subset of the group. There's lots of different subsets and ways we could divide the group apart. Agreed? Yeah, lots of options. So we want to know, what we want to know is how many options do we have, right? So if we have n people, n elements, n items in our group, in our set, the number of subsets is 2 to the n. And I want to show you an example where that actually works um, with a small number, because if you get a big number, it becomes very big very quickly, um, and that's just not necessary. Um, and then the number of proper subsets is simply one less. Um, so let me actually do a group, and we'll just do letters. I think that'll work just fine. It's got the letters A, B, and C in it. This is our set. It's a set A, the set B, I'm sorry, the set A, B, C. And I'm going to list out all the subsets. Now, the first two that I'm going to list are the ones that people often forget. So that's why I'm going to list them first, so that maybe next time when you see this, you'll think of them first as well. There are two sets that feel like, well, that almost feels like cheating. One set is the whole set itself. By definition, a set is a subset of itself, because everything in the set is in the set. It feels like cheating. It feels silly but it, it by definition works. The other subset that people often forget is the empty set. Again, like we've already encountered today, it feels funny, right? You're like, okay, there's nothing in it. Does it really exist? Well, it does. It's just a set with nothing in it. So these are the two that people tend to forget. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to do sets that have either one item or two items. So if we're doing one item, we've got the set with A, We've got the set with B, and we've got the set with C. And there are no more one item subsets. Agreed? Okay. So the next thing we want to do is we want to pair with them up. So if I have A, B, and C, I could put A and B in a group together, right, in a set, subset together. So A, B is a subset. I could put A and C together. or I can put B and C together. Any other combination of the two is simply one of these already. So you might say, okay, well, I, well, I didn't do B, A. Well, I don't need to do B, A. I did A, B. The order doesn't matter. They're already in a group together written down, a set together written down, okay? Count them. How many is that with the first two? Eight. Count eight. All right, so I have these three, I have these three, and then I have this one and this one. There are eight. Okay, so there are eight of these. So my original set, whoa, my original set had three elements, yes? This is the N that's in the description above, N's three. And my number of subsets, that is not a hashtag, that is a number sign. Okay, the number of subsets we just said was eight. Well, eight is actually two to the power of three. Right? It works. This is a small case. I'm not proving it by this case, but I want to justify that you can see that if I tried to do this for a small case, it satisfies that condition. The second definition on here talking about number of proper subsets. This one right here is not a proper subset. Okay, so this one, 
Hang on, I need to just give myself some a little bit more space. This one is not proper. Remember, a proper subset has to be actually smaller than the set itself. And this one's not, it's exactly the same size. So when you're looking at proper subsets, that's why it's the minus one in that definition, right? You just remove the whole set itself. You've got one fewer than you had before. Now we have seven. Okay, so I'm not going to ask you to show me why this works with a specific example. In fact, I'm fairly certain it doesn't even ask. Uh, it might ask in one case for you to write out like the subsets or something like that, but it's not going to be a, a sticking point. The sticking point is how many of them there are, okay, and the relationship between the two. So when we look at this example right here, what we do is we say, okay, well, how many of the items are there? So we looked at this notation last time that said the number of items in the set A, N of A. How many of them are there? Real quick count, what you got? Five, thank you. There are five, A, B, C, D, E. There are five items in that set, okay? So what this previous slide said is that the number of subsets, this is part A, should be 2 to the power 5. Does anybody know what 2 to the 5th is? 32. It is 32. There are 32 subsets. And what do I have to do for part B to get the number of proper subsets? You just take them off, right? Whoa, sorry. 32 minus 1, so there's 31. Okay, does that make sense? So if they actually list them all out for you like this one, it's a very straightforward question. You're counting, it's 2 to that power, and you take one away for the other answer. B is, or not B, well, it's set B. Number 7, set B, is a little harder because they don't list them all out for you. So the first thing you need to do is stuff we did back in section 2.1. You need to figure out what items this is describing because this is the set notation that we're less familiar and less comfortable with. This talks about things being odd, right? even versus odd. And let me just tell you right now because every now and then it comes up somewhere along the way, e zero is an even number. Zero is not neither. Sometimes people tell me zero is neither. No, it's not. Zero is even. Zero is definitely even, okay? It doesn't come into play on this particular problem, but it might on a problem you see later. Zero is even. So odd numbers, we're working with odd numbers. And it specifically says between. So between means you don't get to include the endpoints. That's another thing that people sometimes confuse with the language. Between means nine, negative nine and positive four. Those numbers, even if they're odd, are not included in this description. Okay? So we're not going to include negative nine. But I kind of like for us to start at negative 9 and work our way upward to figure out what we are going to include. If we can make a list like we had in problem number 6, then it becomes just like problem 6. It's a counting game, right? So we're going to actually list what these items are. So after negative 9, if you go the next odd number bigger, what do you get? Negative 7 is right. And after negative 7, we have negative 5. And then negative 3, and then negative 1, 1, and 3. And we have to stop there because we've hit the end. We've hit, I mean, if we go one bigger, right, it would be 5, and 5 is bigger than the number 4, so we're stopped. So how many is this? So this is really set B. What is the number of items that we have here? There are 6. Yes, sir. Because zero is even. And this says odd. Yeah. Um, if it did say even, we would want to make sure we counted zero, is why I was mentioning it before. So, not that that related directly to this problem. I just know that it's one of those things that pops up, and when it does, people get a little bit leery. Zero is, zero is an interesting number. So, okay. Everybody good so far? Yes, sir. Uh, How did I know to end at 3? Because this says that I'm supposed to be between negative 9 and 4. So if I were to keep going bigger, I would be outside of the range of the word between. Okay. Any other questions? All right. 
I've got six items. So how many subsets do I have? How do I find them? Two to the sixth. Two to the sixth. Perfect. Okay. It's two to the sixth. Um, at this point, if you don't know what two to the sixth is, that's perfectly fine. Grab a calculator. Calculator will do it just fine. It's two times two times two, six times, right? Does anybody know what two to the sixth is? 64. Okay. So we got 64. Cool. So then how many proper subsets do I have? 63. So this is also a very classic case where when I go in and I do editing, I end up giving partial credit. Because obviously if you make a mistake on part A, but you understand that it's one fewer on part B, they're both going to be wrong, right? Because they hinge upon each other. So if you screw up part A, I don't want you to get part B wrong because you understand the relationship between the two items. You just made a mistake in one part of it. So this is a place where I often end up having extra credit because of that. So that's an example of a place where extra credit happens, where it's not really a typo. There is a mathematical error, but I know what happened, and so I can award partial credit. Any questions on that? All right. That's it. So reminders. <laughs> 